the largest industry in the United States today is information technologies. The second largest industry and the fastest growing industry in the United States today is something called life coaching, personal consultation. I don't know if any of you have hired a life coach. I don't know if any of you have been hired as a life coach. It is a new, remarkable entrepreneurial enterprise. You don't have to be licensed or certified yet to be a life coach. And you can help people through encouragement, brutal honesty, and perspective in any area of life that they want to be coached, from business to sports to nutrition to environmental impact. You can hire a life coach to help you learn to exercise, to help you with your parenting, to increase your self-actualization and self-love, to be more environmentally responsible, to assist your social media presence, or to run your awareness campaign. One life coach advertises his ability to eliminate self-defeating behavior, maximize self-control and control over your situation, to cultivate greater internal freedom, improving focus, effectiveness, inner peace, and happiness. He promises to help you succeed despite past problems or current challenges, to remain present. I'm not sure how you remain future or past, but to remain present and at peace regardless of specific challenges. He promises emotional and mental self-mastery that elevates your performance to a higher level, creating consistent winning advantage. And I love this one. He promises nexus training. I have no idea what that is. It just sounds cool. The bottom line for all of the life coaches advertising their services out there is the provision of happiness, fulfillment, meaning, joy, purpose, peace, or satisfaction in whatever endeavor you desire to be coached. It would be great to be coached by someone who had all of the answers. And this morning, we get to receive some life coaching from King Solomon, the one who was born wise and then supernaturally gifted to be the wisest man who ever lived, and one who plied his wisdom to explore more wisdom and more knowledge until he exhausted every avenue of knowledge that was available to him. And after he squandered all of his gifts and returned to the Lord in his repentance, he pens for us the book of Ecclesiastes. It is his swan song, his final sermon. It is his word of wisdom to us who seek to be wise. And what we're going to find in this morning's passage as we continue our study of the book of Ecclesiastes is the secret to happiness in life. In fact, that's what I've titled the message this morning, The Secret to Happiness in Life. And that is a bold title. Anything with a definite article, the anything, uh, seems almost preposterous. And yet I would suggest to you that this portion of God's word that we will look at absolutely delivers on the promise to give the secret to happiness in life. And specifically, to life in a broken world. Life in a fallen world. Life in a world marked by sin and disease and death and destruction and hardship. I want us to read together Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Verses 8 to 20. Listen to God's word through the pen of King Solomon. If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official and there are higher officials over them. After all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This, too, is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. 
that when those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? Throughout his life, he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, to enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him. For this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. Will you pray with me? God, we come to your word this morning, needy people. We are in need of hearing from you, of clarifying our world and our place in this world and our relation to you and our relation to all that is around us. Lord, we are bombarded day after day, moment by moment, every week with those things which compete with your worldview, your perspective, your truth. And we are desperate to hear from you. Would you recalibrate our hearts? Would you recalibrate our affections? Would you reset the compass of the direction of our life? God, we love you, though we do so imperfectly. We know you. We want to know you more. We cling to your promises, and we want to cling tighter. God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear by the power of your Holy Spirit the glorious truths in your word here this morning. We ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. This morning, we're going to see that Solomon delivers three directives intended to help people find happiness in a broken world. Three directives intended to help people find happiness in a broken world. And these are life coaching tips for navigating the fallen world in which we live. Remember, you and I live post-fall, east of Eden, outside of the garden, in a planet that is cursed, its population plagued by the incurable sickness called sin, with all of its concomitant effects. The first directive Solomon gives for navigating this life, even for eking out happiness in this broken world, is this. Number one, come to grips. Come to grips with the reality that sinful man's silly solutions to life's prickly problems will always be unsatisfactory. Come to grips with the reality that sinful man's silly solutions to life's prickly problems will always be unsatisfactory. This is how Solomon says it in verses 8 and 9. If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked. Here he focuses our attention on injustice, oppression, and specifically he gives oppression of the poor. And, and I think this is something of a metonymy that is a, a single illustration, a, a single instance that illustrates the whole principle that this world is not what it should be. And when he says, do not be shocked, <laughs> he, he's shocked, he tells us not to be shocked about something he himself says is wrong. Oppression of the poor, a, a smashing of the most vulnerable among us under the hand of the powerful. And then he goes on to describe the denial of justice and righteousness in the land. And the word denial there is literally the word robbery. The robbery of justice, the, the stealing away of that which is right in the land. And what is he talking about here? He, he's talking about the system. And he uses a rare word for the land, the, the province. When you see these things in the province, this, this may be a reference uh, this is probably a borrowed Persian word. He may be ref referencing the Persian system of bureaucratic hierarchy. Uh, they're satraps. They're, 
government rulers who ruled one over the other in this uh, perpetual scheme of envy and greed and rivalry, where if you got rewarded for tattletaling on the other guy because it went up the chain, and that guy got in trouble by the guy over him who's taking money off the top, who's taking money off the guy below him, who's skimming the profits from the guy below him, and, and eventually down at the bottom of this whole system, you have the poor. You have the, the hoi polloi, the common people, who, who are robbed of righteousness and justice. If, if someone complains, something happened to me that's not right, you take it to one official, and that official takes it to another official, that to another official, and that to another official, and eventually to the king, if it goes that far. But at every level, there is corruption. At every level, there is bribery. Every level, there are people. Solomon says, don't be shocked at this kind of thing. The bureaucratic nightmare of what government is, is just normal. Sometimes we think of government as some sort of mechanistic, impersonal entity that's just out there. You know, the government should, the government should do this, the government should not do that. Well, the, the government is people. And I'm not talking about, you know, in the U.S. Constitution, government for the people, by the people. I mean, government entities are made up of sinners, <laughs> At every level. One official over another, another official over them. The problem with the system is the system is people. The more people get involved, the worse it gets. The, the longer the supply chain, the more people you have to mess it up. The, the longer the bureaucracy, the longer the chain of command, the more you have people eking out their own selfish greed at every level. And sometimes the distance between the people who make the rules and the people who have to live under the rules seems an infinity. And the people in power are untouchable. And you know, every election cycle, we tend to renew our hope in mankind's ability to solve world problems. <laughs> Solomon doesn't. Of course, he didn't face an election. He just was king. This is a remarkable thing for a king to say, right? King Solomon is the government. He is the system. And he says, mankind's hope is not in the system. It can't be. Mankind can't put hope in mankind. Mankind is the problem. <laughs> Do you understand that the problem of the world is the consequence of man's rebellion against God? Sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, but all of it flowing out of Genesis 3 and the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. And so for mankind to think that he can solve mankind's problems when mankind is the problem, well, that's a fatal logical flaw. What do communism and capitalism have in common? Well, they may be on different ends of a spectrum of experiments with human governance. But they both have people in common. Greedy, sinful, selfish people. Some human government systems are designed to protect the people from the people more than others. But they all have the same fundamental problem. What does Solomon say is the solution to this? Well, he, he doesn't really give a solution. Again, what is Solomon doing in this book? This isn't to say there aren't solutions or ways to ameliorate this problem, but Solomon is driving us to despair of life under the sun so that we begin to look up, so that we don't put all our eggs in the basket of this temporal existence, so that we live for eternal realities, so that we long for eternal truths, so that we long for home in heaven with our king. That's what he's driving us towards. That's the conclusion of his sermon in chapter 12. In the meantime, he drives us to despair over the way things are. And yet, even this despair comes with a little caveat in verse 9. Notice what Solomon says there. After all, a, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. What is he saying? <laughs> a bureaucratic nightmare with the injustices and oppressions that just happen in it is better than anarchy. Right? Solomon is no revolutionary here. He's no anarchist. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever experienced a season of outright anarchy. 
I doubt that any of us have, but if you could imagine it for a moment, uh, imagine no property rights. Imagine no protections from enemies, foreign or domestic. Imagine no reliable infrastructure, water or power or sewage or any of those kinds of things. No, no markets to buy or sell. No stable currency with which to trade. Can you imagine a scene like that? And, and Solomon in verse 9 uses agriculture as the illustration for the benefits of bad government. Right? A, a king who cultivates the land is an advantage. It's better that there's a bad, big, bureaucratic government than anarchy. You can't grow tomatoes if you can't rely on the water and if somebody's going to come steal them before you eat them. Anarchy would be a, a really devastating human existence. One writer put it this way, government may be evil, but for now it is a necessary evil. That's right. The human government is a good lens through which to examine all of man's little attempts to ameliorate the effects of the fall. You think about the things we suffer under as a result of Genesis 3. Death, disease, aging, physical pain, natural disasters, all of those things that exist as the creation groans under the fall, Romans 8, 17. And you think about those effects that come from human sin, war and crime and hate and greed. Some things that we experience are the effects of the fall and God's curse on creation. Some of the things we experience are the symptoms of sin in the human heart. The technologies, innovations, social theories, experiments in governments, philosophies, psychologies, theories, they all try to mitigate against the things we suffer, disease and death and sin. One very popular approach is just to not call sin, sin. I mean, if we, if we don't call it sin, then it's, then it's not sin, and, and then all the guilt's gone. All those bad feelings just go away until we actually hurt each other. And there's other kinds of bad feelings. The world does not have what it takes to solve the world's problems. And by the world, I mean us. It's not in mankind to solve mankind's problems when mankind is the problem. That's Solomon's first sort of life coaching tip. It, it, um, it kind of deflates the whole self-actualization part of life coaching. Not really encouraging. There's a second sort of life coaching tip that Solomon gives us beginning in verse 10. Recognize the truth that the relentless accumulation of worldly wealth will aggravate rather than satisfy mankind's deepest longings. Recognize the truth that the relentless accumulation of worldly wealth will aggravate rather than satisfy mankind's deepest longings. Solomon addresses here, again, probably as an illustration for all kinds of things we could try to stuff the holes in our hearts with, love of money. Love of money. Notice what he says in verse 10. He who loves money. He's not here talking about the evil of money itself. He's talking about the love of money as an evil. Sometimes we think that the solution to the problem of the love of money or the problem of greed is, well, I just need more money. That, that will end my greed. Of course, we know that doesn't work. Uh, sometimes we think, well, the solution to greed in the human heart is less money. <laughs> And we know that doesn't work either. Uh, people in abject poverty can be greedy. People with everything in the world can be greedy. The problem is human hearts, problem is not money. The problem is an inordinate love of money. What man needs is not more money or less money, but a change of affections, a transformation of loves at the heart level. We're going to look here at seven problems with the love of money. This is all under point number two, so I don't want you to get it confused on the outline here. Uh, there are three life tips and seven things under number two. That's where we're going here. Uh, the first problem with the love of money, he gives us in verse 10. Love of money is an unsatisfying addiction. Notice what he says. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance will not be satisfied with its income. 
And this too is Hevel, right? That, that emptiness, that vanity that he's been describing throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. A love of money is an unsatisfying addiction. It's kind of like salt water when you're really thirsty. I don't know if you've ever been really thirsty. A number of years ago, I read about Stephen Callahan. In 1982, he was in a, a solo sailboat race from Europe to the Caribbean. He crashed off the Azores. His boat sank. He got everything he could out of the sailboat and, and lived for 76 days solo on an inflatable raft. Set a world record. I don't know if I'd like to set that world record. 76 days at sea, longest to survive solo adrift in a raft. And he, and he floated to within sight of the island, which was his original intended destination, where fishermen picked him up. And he talks about in his delirium, thirsty beyond most of our comprehension, he began to crave the salt water all around him. And salt water makes you crazy. It adds to the delirium, and, and salt water intake convinces you that salt water will quench your thirst, and that it tastes sweet and good and lovely and wonderful, and oh, don't you just want some more? One of the things that Stephen Callahan rescued out of his sinking sailboat was the story of another man who had survived a long time alone on a raft, and who wrote about the delirium induced by salt water intake, and Stephen Callahan vowed, I'm not going to fall for it, I'm not going to fall for it, and he kept that book with him. And he still felt the delirious cravings for salt water to quench his thirst. And the more his rationed water and the water he collected by solar stills was tainted with the salt water that splashed in by the waves, the more he craved the salt water. Love of money is like that. It creates a hunger for itself. It invigorates a thirst for the very thing that will make you more thirsty and will never satisfy. That's Solomon's point in verse 10. Derek Kidner said it this way, If anything is worse than the addiction that money brings, it is the emptiness it leaves. Man, with eternity in his heart, needs better nourishment than this. There's a second problem with the love of money. Verse 11, love of money attracts leeches. Verse 11, Solomon says, when good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what advantage has the owner except to just watch, to look on? To watch as all the phony friends, the, the, the fake friends. You know, Eric Clapton sang about those. He, he said, nobody loves you when you're down and out. But when you get back on your feet again, everybody wants to be your long lost friend. And for Solomon, the enjoyment of, of all of his possessions and all of his treasures dimmed as he was left just to look on at, at all the hangers-on that just tried to get a piece of what he had. It was discouraging. There's another problem with the love of money. It's in verse 12. Love of money provides restless nights and no peace. He contrasts this in verse 12 with the sleep of the working man. He says, the sleep of the working man is pleasant whether he eats a little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. Again, he's still talking about the, the problems with the love of money, and, and by contrast, the, the guy who doesn't have a lot, but, but he's working all day, he, he's going to sleep well at night, even if he didn't have as much to eat. But the rich man, with all the luxury of all the foods he could possibly want, has indigestion throughout the night that keeps him up. He's not going to sleep well because of all the luxurious foods he's been eating. And, and some have said he stays up at night because he's worried about his money. Uh, some commentators have said, well, he, he just can't fall asleep because of indigestion. Uh, maybe Solomon means both of these things. Regardless, it's everything that the money has brought into his life. It hasn't brought him peace. It hasn't brought him rest. And, and he can't buy a good night's sleep. Every single one of us in this room is inordinately wealthy. You understand that, right? Compared to the, 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 the vast expanse of human history, you line up all the people who have ever lived and you compare what you have, uh, your possessions, your access, the luxury, the food you eat, the things you have access to, uh, far surpasses the wealth of almost every human being who has gone before you and every human being contemporaneous to you. You understand that, right? 
One of the ironies is you and I, as a culture, spend a lot of money trying to undo the effects of having a lot of money, right? The gym membership, the fitness club, what, what are we doing? We're, we're trying to undo the effects of, well, I have to work all day just to get bread. I burn all the calories that I eat. You know, we, we actually have so much money that we have to spend money to burn the calories that we're not burning by earning. There's another problem with the love of money. It's in verse 13. Love of money costs you. There's pain in the getting. Verse 13, Solomon calls this a grievous evil. This grievous evil which I've seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. Oh, I just, I love money. Well, well, why is it no fun to work this hard to get what's not satisfying? And the one who is in love with the collection of money suffers in the acquisition of it. Solomon calls it a grievous evil. And this word for grievous is a, a word that means sickness, a, a morbid sickness, the, the kind of sickness that is virtually incurable that most probably leads to death. This is a, a grievous, scarcely cur curable, painful calamity. In other words, the man Solomon is describing here goes to great pains and personal sacrifice just to get more. And then in verse 14, he transitions to another problem with the love of money. There's not just pain in the getting, but love of money brings pain in the losing Pain in the losing. Look at verse 14. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing left to support him or literally his hand was empty at the end of verse 14. The love of money brings pain in the losing. You see, there's something worse. There's a worse feeling than being poor. It's the feeling of becoming poor. When you had much and, and then you lost it. <laughs> And there's something worse yet. When you hoped that all of your miserly sacrifice would go to benefit your children, and now it is all gone, leaving literally nothing in the hand, nothing to pass on. The pain and the losing. Verses 15 and 16 give us the sixth problem with the love of money. And you know this one already. You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. Money is difficult to hold on to in life, and it's impossible in death. Look at what Solomon says. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what advantage to him who toils for the wind? So whether a man loses his money in a bad business deal so that he's empty-handed or he takes it all with him to the grave, it goes no further and he goes into the next life empty-handed as well. Solomon is likely echoing Job's words in Job 121. Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a different perspective than the man who is infatuated with the collection of acquisitions he cannot keep. Psalm 49, 17, the psalmist writes, when the man dies, he will carry nothing away. And in 1 Timothy 6, 7, Paul echoes the same thought, for we have brought nothing into the world, so we can take nothing out of it either. And verse 17 gives us the seventh problem with the love of money. Love of money ends in a lonely, joyless, frustrating sickness. I mean, who's ever heard of the happy miser? As Solomon describes him here in verse 17, throughout his life he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. And eating in darkness is a picture of joyless isolation. Whatever friends he thought he had bought early on in life, now they're all gone. Whatever family he had sacrificed to get all this worthless stuff, they're gone too. And he's alone in the dark eating his meal. And he's plagued by what Solomon decries, great vexation, sickness, and anger. Maybe he's mulling over that bad investment. 
Maybe he's babbling on about the burgeoning tax burden of a bloated bureaucracy. Maybe he suffers wearying anxiety about how to protect what he's collected. Or he's stewing over the business partners that cheated him. Or maybe he's coming to terms with the finality of death and the realization that his life's pursuit has been a chasing of wind. If you give your love to something that is ever slipping through your fingers, something that can't be kept, and even if held on to for a time, it never satisfies. If you set your affections on such a fickle, fleeting lover, you will end up alone and vexed. What are his last thoughts? I labored and I toiled for nothing. And what are his next thoughts after his last thoughts? And I forfeited my soul to do it. Remember what Jesus said about that? What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? To wake up in eternity before a holy God who will demand account for the way that you lived your life and realize all you have brought to God's table is you. Your own unrighteousness, all your crimes, all your rebellions, all your selfishness, all your greed, that pile of money got left behind. Martin Luther said, God permits the very riches in which people trust to bring about the ruin of those who own them. The lonely miser in darkness and vexation feels it a little bit in this life. And everyone outside of Christ will feel it in the next. There's a third sort of life coaching tip Solomon gives. And if the first two were sort of a mouthful, I, I didn't really intend for you to memorize those and think about them at lunch today. I, I just want you to think about this last one. It's a little easier to get. Worship God. Worship God. This is the secret to happiness in life. This is it. It's not really that much of a secret. Solomon's been driving at it in all of Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes 12, he says, This is the conclusion. When all has been heard, fear God and keep His commandments. That is, a right relationship to your Maker changes everything. Even brings about happiness in a fallen, broken sin-plagued, God-cursed world, a bent universe that nobody can straighten. And happiness is available to those who know Him, to those rightly related to their Maker. Happiness is there. Really, this verse and the themes that unfold from here through the rest of the book of Ecclesiastes off of this theme, it's a theology of fun, a theology of enjoyment, a, a theology of earthly delight, a theology of receiving the good gifts that God gives, appreciating them for what they are, and being in love with the giver of the gift, worshiping the creator rather than the created thing. Solomon's recommendation here is this, enjoy God's gifts as gifts from him, for God is the one who gives good things and the ability to enjoy them. This is the way it unfolds. Verse 18, here is what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, to enjoy oneself and all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and empowerment to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor, all of this is a gift from God. For the man will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. Clearly, Solomon is talking about life on this earth. He's not talking about heaven yet. And he's talking about happiness, joy, delight available here for those who know God. In verse 18, he says, Enjoy the good things in life as God's gifts. And the key words here in these three verses are God and gift. And you can just mark those later this afternoon. Notice how many times Solomon says God and he says gift or given in these three verses. In verse 19, he unfolds the reality that God alone is the giver of all good gifts and God alone gives the key that unlocks them. 
And then in verse 20, he simply says the result is life flies by. Or the futility of life in a cursed world is lessened. Now, the New American Standard Version, uh, the text that I'm reading from this morning in verse 19, I think gives us an unhelpful translation. Uh, The New American Standard reads this way, As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. And the way that reads is God is the one who gives rich people their stuff, And God empowers all rich people to enjoy their stuff. That's what the New American Standard reads. And I don't think that's helpful for two reasons. Number one, it's not what the Hebrew text says. It's not what the original says. Uh, And the original is pretty clear. And it also doesn't fit Solomon's context and the flow of his argument. In fact, you don't have to go very far to see that Solomon himself undermines that translation. Uh, Look two sentences, or really one sentence later, chapter 6, verse 1. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it's prevalent among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet, God has not empowered him to eat from them. Do you understand? There are two gifts here that God gives. Nice things and the ability to enjoy them. Now, we've used this illustration before. A, a can of cold peaches on a hot day and a can opener. <laughs> Both things are important. Uh, God, the sovereign creator over all things, the one who sustains all of life and holds all men to account, can give people a cold can of peaches on a hot day and no can opener. (laughs) The can opener is available to those who love him, to those who know him. It's the point of the book of Ecclesiastes. So in the first half, uh, this This verse in Hebrew is really broken up into into two halves, and and they're not halves by how many words are in each half, but halves by logical statements. The first half is, to every man whom God gives, and the second half is, it's a gift. In other words, this is all about God's grace, God's giving, God's kindness. To, To the one whom God gives things, remember, that's God giving them. That's the point of the verse. Now, what does God give in the first half of the verse? Riches, empowerment, empowerment to eat, to receive his reward, and to rejoice. It's possible that God, in his undeserved kindness, may give you earthly delights in some measure or another. And it's possible to not have the ability to find satisfaction in them. In fact, that's the reality for the world that pursues those things apart from a right relationship to God. If you're looking at the English Standard Version, uh, I think it reads better. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. Okay, that's, a, that's a good translation. The idea here is not to pick the translation we like best, but the one that best reflects the intent of the author. You have to understand that happiness in a broken world is available only to those in a right relationship with their maker. And this requires a fundamental change from the disposition in which you were born. All of us by nature, all of us by birth, we got this from our parents, and you can blame your parents afterwards at lunchtime, or you can call them this afternoon if you want and say, Mom, Dad, this is your fault that I was like this. (laughs) And it was their parents' fault, all the way back to Adam and Eve. That we were born not running to God, but running away from God. Running away from God in our own rebellions. Running away from God in our own self-strength. Seeking out life for ourselves. Life on our own terms with me as the boss. With self as the giver, the provider, right? From you and to you and through you are all things. To you be the glory forever. Amen. That's how we were all born. And what's needed here, the, the secret to life, the secret to happiness, happiness here, happiness now, happiness forever, is to turn from everything you are and to turn to God alone. Right? What life coach is going to tell you this? You need to repent. 
A life coach committed to self-actualization is not going to tell you the key, the secret of life, the secret to happiness is self-abandonment. You need to run away from everything that you are and everything you've made of yourself. You need to run to God. You, you can be happy, but, but you must surrender to God. You must know God. You must trust God. That is precisely the implication of these last three verses in chapter 5. The universe is full of God's beauty, His gifts, delight, enjoyments. There's a theology of fun available here. But as we will see in this book, access to it is only available to those who know God. There are essentially two approaches that, that people take to try to find happiness. Uh, one is all about self. I, I toil and toil and toil and end up with nothing. I try everything under the sun to, to eke happiness out of life here and be left empty-handed. For all of the work, all of the labor, all of the efforts, the happiness is forever elusive. The other approach, aside from toil, toil, toil and get nothing, is to trust and get everything. You see, happiness from God to the creature is offered as a free gift. A free gift. Notice the time Solomon says, gift and receive and giver, all from God in this text. You see, the Christian is neither the voracious miner you know, the, a miner digging holes in the ground, trying to turn everywhere he can, turn over every stone to find precious metals and, and get them out. Every, everywhere he can, get more. The Christian is not the voracious miner or the vexed miser, but he is a content worshiper of the giver of all good things. And to whatever degree God says, son, daughter of mine, I want you to have this, and because you know me, you get to enjoy it for as long as I have it in your life. And the worshiper says, God, thank you. This sweet gift, this delight, this fun, this great meal, this sweet relationship, this delightful excursion is a reflection of your bounty. It comes from you, and I love you, the giver of the gift. That is the approach that the Christian has. And it's offered by a loving God who's not stingy, but loves to give good gifts to his children and promises to do so in infinite measure for their ever-increasing delight for all of eternity, right? Psalm 1611, at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. Just like the two approaches to happiness, toil, toil, toil and get nothing, or trust and get everything. There are really two approaches to God in the world, two approaches to eternal life. You know, there is uh, the, the, the approach of man's religion, which is toil, 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 and get nothing. And then there is the gospel, which is trust and get everything. Do you understand the fundamental difference between biblical Christianity, the great news of the gospel, the free offer of eternal life on God's terms, is that it is a free gift. Where everything else, all of man's religions, are an attempt at self-actualization or self-effort or self-righteousness. You've got to do this and this and this and this if you're going to get to heaven. <laughs> and God says to you, abandon all of it. <laughs> It will never purchase heaven for you because you can never pay for your own crimes. You can never balance out the scales with goodness to outweigh your badness. In fact, every time you think you've got goodness and you're paying for your badness, you're just adding more badness to the badness pile. Turn away from all of it and receive from God the free gift of eternal life. And the great question we have to ask is, how can a holy, righteous God who hates sin freely offer such a grand, glorious, wonderful gift for free to those who will believe and trust in Him? How can He do that? That's not right. That's not just. In one sense, it's, it's not just at all. How, how am I the guilty one to 
go free? How is it that I, the, the criminal against his holy and high majesty, to be forgiven? And I know you know the answer. The answer is the cross, where God himself took on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and went to the cross specifically to give up his life as a ransom, an innocent substitute, dying in the place of wretched sinners like you and me, so that God could pour out his infinite wrath against all the crimes, past, present, and future, of everyone who would ever believe, pour them all out on his son. And as Jake said it earlier today in the communion message, to impute to us Jesus' righteousness, while imputing to Jesus our crimes. And so that God could be just and the justifier of those who believe. God gets to declare us righteous. And he gets to maintain his own reputation as righteous only by pouring out his wrath on the righteous substitute, Jesus Christ. And if you will believe in him today, then my friend, you get the key to everything. Not just happiness in a broken world, but an eternity in God's glorious presence where he ever and forever and forever seeks to dispense his infinite riches and treasures and the glories and the beauties and the delights and the excellencies of knowing him to you without end. Will you turn to him to have life, to have it abundantly? If you don't know Christ, my friend, it's there for you today if you will turn to him. And if you're here this morning and, and you don't yet know what I'm talking about, you, you don't know Christ, you haven't had your sins forgiven, you haven't found the happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction, you've been searching for in all the wrong places. Will you come find me? I, I'd love to talk with you. I'd, I'd love to pray with you and help you discover everything. Let's pray. God, we pray that we would no longer be deceived by the trinkets and the trash of this world, but we would ever be riveted by your glories, your beauties, your infinite delights. May we know you, may we love you, may we trust you. God, I pray that we in this room who know you already would not be distracted, choked out by the things of this world. But God, ever give us an eternal perspective on life. May we not waste our moments and our days and our relationships, but may we use them to purchase people for your own possession for eternity. May we lay up even for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. And Lord Jesus, you are our treasure. High King of heaven, it is to you we sing in the name of your Son.